Big John here. I'm backstage with Backstage 360 here with Billy Stevens of, uh, well, Billy, Billy Stevens. Stevens. Yes, sir. You're, you're releasing a new album. That's what we're here to talk about. Absolutely. But first, I want to talk about the man, Billy Stevens. Okay. Because I, I did a little bit of research and I found that when you're, you're like maybe at your biggest, you were in a band called Handsome Devil. You yeah. recorded three albums and, mm -hmm. uh, and those went pretty good. And that's... You got pretty good response here in Southern California. So tell me about that and your start in music there. Yeah, well, if you don't mind, if I take you back just a little bit right before oh, Handsome Devil. Do. What Basically, um, Handsome Devil was started by Danny Walker and myself, who used to be in another band called Wank. And we were in Southern California. Let me interrupt you real quick, because I, I heard about Wank. Yeah. And I went to research and, and try to find some information about that. And I stopped really quickly yeah. because I, I Googled Wank music. Look and out. I, and, and I'm telling you, if you Google Wank music, make sure you're not on company time. It's kind of dangerous. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I Google, digress. Google Wank USA. Oh, a, <laughs> that might be worse. In America, it's got, <laughs> it's got a little bit of a different rub to it. <laughs> I like that. All righty, yeah. continue. So, um... We actually um, were an Orange County band, and we uh, were playing a show, and Mike Ness from Social Distortion came out, yeah. liked us a lot, and wanted to work with us, and so we did a, a record called Get a Grip on Yourself, <laughs> uh, Yeah. and um, that was picked up by Madonna's record label, Maverick Records. Oh, wow. Um, toured all over America, and then... Um, was that a Wank America tour? Yeah, okay. Wank USA. Wank USA, love, As, gotta love Yeah, it. we hit all kinds of towns. Yeah, this is, this is, this is thick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then things got sticky uh, towards the end. <laughs> no, um, what, what ended up happening was that the band broke up, a couple of the guys didn't like being on the road, and so the, the other guitar player and myself started Handsome Devil, and the following year signed RCA Records. Okay, that's where the Maverick ties in comes in. Okay. Yeah, and so then on RCA we did three, well we did a, uh, the first uh, two records were affiliated with RCA and the last one was an independent release. Now in your new album you do all the writing yourself. Yes, <laughs> with with Handsome Devil, um, yeah, even on the, the uh, when we originally put the band together, uh, the other guitar player and I, we were both writing and we were both singing. Okay. And even the first single, Making Money, which um, had Alan Thicke in the video. Oh, it, yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we both sing on that. We both contributed and put that together. And then um, as the band went on, I started getting more into the producing end of it. So I actually opened a recording facility and started producing records. So the last two uh, Handsome Devil records I produced and contributed a little bit on the writing while the other guitar player took over the bulk of the writing. Uh, okay. That's how it kind of evolved. So that's how you started getting involved with your producing, is you got a lot of credits with your producing credits. Now, did you do a lot of work with Mike Ness? Because he came out and he liked your band. Did, did you uh, like do a lot of work under him? Um, no, we did. Um, in Wank, we did like three, three four songs, about a, almost half the record with him. In different studios, different places. And so then... Um, Basically, I really got into it working um, after we did the Wank record. It was remixed by Mark Trombino, and I was in on that. And then um, Handsome Devil's first record was done by Ed Stasium, who did all the Ramones records. Yeah. And I was in on that. I still talk to Ed. He actually lives just outside of San Diego now. So when I was doing my research, and I noticed that there's a couple of producers that stood out, because before I started researching, I listened to your music, and I noticed a lot of influences mm -hmm. that I could poke out. And, and, and when I started looking at your influences as a producer, I started recognizing it, especially like, it feels like you do a lot of uh, tribute to Tenacious D and their style uh, and Mike D. It's like, you look up to that style, like that's kind of a more of what I hear in a lot of your album, or a lot of your tracks on this album. Cool. And then also with the Ed Stasium, with the Ramones, the kind yeah. of upbeat, the, the kind of, I would almost call it time pressure, or time sensitive music, you know? Yeah, yeah, Ed, Ed's amazing, and he's really, <clears throat> what I took from him is how to take a four piece band, and then really kind of get depth, and a lot of versatility and emotions out of that, when you're using just the same instrumentation. So getting back to the album itself, I, I noticed on a couple of your tracks, like I said, with, with the Tenacious D, um, the a Boy and a Girl, uh -huh. that track seemed like it got a lot of uh, a lot of sounds very similar to what uh, I would hear on a Tenacious D album. Oh, that's cool. I like those guys. So what what uh, what's like the impetus for that song, A Boy and a Girl? Honestly, I wanted to take 
a song that had kind of like an aggro crazy verse. The vocals are a little distorted and it's got like that attitude in the verses where, you know, the storyline, things are getting shot up and things are crazy and they're out to, to take over the world. But then I wanted a really pop kind of almost dopey love song for the chorus. That, that kind of where it, it started sounding like Lit, like where are, you've got some influence from Lit's producer as well, right? Well, actually the funny thing is Lit, Jeremy from Lit, who was part on the producing of the Handsome mm. Devil stuff, was a huge Wank fan. Wow. And so, because we used to play the same clubs, and so when Wank broke up, Jeremy approached Dan and myself and said, guys, whatever you do, don't sign with another label, put a new band together, but I want to, to be involved in it, and their record, My Own Worst Enemy, that album just went platinum. Yeah. And so when Jeremy got back from doing the No Doubt tour, we all sat down, he listened to a bunch of songs we had. He said, I'd really like to take these couple. We went in the studio, did three. He walked them into RCA. The president came and saw us live, and that night we had a record deal. And so that's how you formed Handsome Devil. So, yeah. So Jeremy from Lit had a big hand in forming Handsome Devil. Yeah, well, he had a big hand, and he walked us right into RCA because he was like, I really like you guys. And actually, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, earlier Lit was kind of hard and almost yeah. like, like in your face and, and had a little Alice in Chains and kind of heaviness to it. And then Wink came out, which was more poppy. And then the Lit record came out, which was more poppy. And then it it just kind of circled all around. We kind of influenced what they were doing. And then he turned around and, and brought us in and helped us take our thing to the next level. Well, you definitely have a, a that, that pop 90s feel in a lot yeah. of your We all played the songs. same clubs. We all went to the yeah. same, you know, it's like that little Orange County scene. The big hit was No Doubt and Offspring blew up out of it. Oh, and yeah. then and then we came out all at the same time as like Real Big Fish and mm -hmm. Save Ferris. And there's a lot of other little bands going on. And Litton, Wank and Handsome Devil, all that was all part of the second wave of Orange County. Oh, that's the, I actually lived in Huntington Beach, California in yeah. 1998, 99. Dude. So right at the precipice of all that, and I, I joined the military right around that time frame, so I yeah. missed out on the second wave. So that's, yeah. un unfortunately, I didn't get to be involved with that, but I tell you, if you listen to this album, your new album, now it's called American Yosha? Yusha. 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 Oh, that's right, I forgot to write a U. And it's, it's actually a, a <laughs> Chinese, like, legendary character, and it's a person that just kind of wonders and from place to place and they kind of live by their own code of rules and and if they see something that doesn't quite jive with them they jump in and handle it now the, the first track on your album kind of goes through that yeah and and that's like a, a setup to the entire theme of your album yeah now where is that that's is obviously that's your voice yeah okay so is that a, a poem that you're reading something you wrote I, I wrote it basically what i wanted to do was tell the story of of how it evolved from an ancient Chinese character and how it ties in to me doing a, a record because what I wanted to do, kind of like, you know, the, uh, my opinion, I'm not super political, but America's <laughs> kind of changed and stuff. And you have all these amazing, like true heroes that have come back from war, Iraq, Afghanistan, and our, our country doesn't really take care of them. And so the whole idea of here's a warrior with really no place to fit in or go, but they kind of over time develop their own standards of what they think's right. And I wanted to tie that in to just different little stories that fit into America. So little subculture stories, you know, a boy and girl in love going on a killing spree. So bring it back to the military. Yeah. I was actually in the military myself, so I kind of understand with your ties to a lot of the frustrations that some of the military members feel and everything. Yeah, and, and that's what I wanted to touch on with the, the whole album. And it's set in like little subculture scenes with each story of the different songs. Yes. And and so you have like, you know, boy and girl, they're in love, but but they go on a like a killing spree or, or the song, What About Me? A lot of people. Um, yes, yes, they actually go on a killing spree. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I had to make sure that it's really, the album is pretty that graphic at times. It's yeah. awesome though. Oh, thanks. Because you, you, what's interesting, okay, it is, the, the album does have some extreme graphic, or graphic like connotations imagery, and language yeah. and imagery, thank you. Um, but you do it in, a, in an artistic, in a tasteful way. Yeah. That it, it's not over the top. So don't be scared of the explicit language on it. It's actually a really well done album. You, you produced oh, it well. Yeah, thank you. And thanks. You're sorry to interrupt, but your message does come clear. Cause it's obvious listening to the track that not only do you get such a wide variety of, of eclectic of, of genres and styles of music, 
it's it's a theme. You can feel the yeah. theme of a story, and it's like a, a heart story. So it, it's amazing how you're able to tie all that through so many different genres and such an eclectic style of instrumentation on the entire album, but it still has that theme carrying through. Yeah, and, and you know, that almost, it, it kind of happened by accident because I put the songs together and I wanted them to kind of flow in feeling and in, in the way the album just moves so that when you listen to it, it felt like a record. I, it's cool to have a single, but it's kind of cool to be able to put on a record and listen to it front to back and go, that kind of took me on a on an adventure or a journey. You know what's <clears> awesome <throat> about it is if you put it on repeat, uh -huh. you don't realize that there's only nine tracks on the album because yeah. it plays through and it keeps going and you feel like you're listening to a radio station that's giving you new music every time. It's like you're hearing your greatest hits, or you're hearing your best favorite songs of all time because you cross, you tie into like the important part of each genre and well, each thanks. style. You, you really pull that emotional part out of it. So you feel like you're listening to a classic rock station Dude, for that entire That's song. a huge compliment. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to do. You know, I just wanted to make sure that when you listen to it and and then if you go a little deeper into the, the subject matter of each song, you know, it starts with the, the attitude and I can do whatever I mm, want. Like the rebellious teenager. The, exactly. Into... You know, lots, a lot of people think the What About Me song is just about a breakup. And when you listen a little deeper, you know, it, it's about a couple who is in love, but they were junkies. Yes, that's you what know? I got from it. it. It's like a starting over. It's almost like an awakening moment in the life. And you realize you just can't, you can't live together based off of the way you were. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's really, it was a very interesting song. And you move that on, on to... Um, I, Haunted? Yeah. I'm ha oh no, back to the grind. Yeah, back to the grind. Uh, but no, the haunted. I'm haunted. One, yeah, I'm. That had a lot of um, like it made me feel kind of you two ish. Yeah, you know what's weird is I've been um, like different people say, dude, I can hear like the every everything from like um, the the plim souls or like a weird kind of even Bauhaus. And I, I was like, that's interested because what I pictured in that mind in that song in my mind what I pictured is you know after you go through life and you're kind of at that point where you're like you know I need to figure out where I am because too much stuff's happened and, and it's not the same anymore and you just find yourself out on a road on a motorcycle or out in the middle of nowhere I ride mm, so nice. you're just out on your bike in the middle of nowhere just thinking it's just kind of trying to work through Absolutely. Everything. And then that song's actually about addiction. Yeah. You know, it says she takes the best of me. It's talking about getting, being addicted. And it's saying, you know, I got away from it, but she comes back and haunts me. It's actually talking about being sober and getting through addiction. And um, I, th I thought it was a, a pretty interesting little twist. It's nice. And you carry that through as a, more of a progression as you get on into the chosen and the holy ones. Yeah. It's kind of like a more, as you've gone through that moment, gone through the haunting, gone through the reconciliation, yeah. you kind of wake up and you, you start to realize what actually matters. Absolutely. You become a king, to, uh, uh, like the king's lament. Yeah. I love that. It's such a beautiful track to kind of polish off the, the album and, and finish, finish the storyline. Thanks. That, I mean, that's what I was going for. And when I was putting it together, I was just like, I, I want to wrap this up with a really serious, like introspective type of song to where it was like, this is really after going through all of this, where I'm at right now. And, and it was cool and it came together. And then, you know, I brought the strings into it and I'm like, it's beautiful. beautiful uh, thanks. Track. Absolutely beautiful time. Now you produced the entire thing yeah. yourself. Yeah. So did you, uh, in terms of the musical part of it, how much of the instrumentation did you actually perform yourself? Um, I had uh, two different amazing drummers actually come in and do two sessions. Okay. Um, actually, um, Tom Varga, who also plays in Green today, okay. came in and did a, a full drum session, and um, we kept a lot of the stuff. And then there was a couple other things that I that after. Just laying more instrumentation, you start getting ideas where you want to go in a, in a different direction. And That's a good producer side. Yeah. Of <laughs> and, a, and an old label mate of mine happened to be in town from for Nam. And so I hit him up. His name's Preston Nash. And, and so he ended up coming over and we did a, another two days with him. And then between the, the two different sessions, I put the drums together. Um, I played bass on half the album. And then I had a, a great bass player named Howard Oliate 
who um, he's been around forever. He's kind of Orange County industry guy. Okay. Come in and lay down bass, and then I did everything else. You know, I did the um, guitars and vocals, kind of what I do. Yeah. So. There you go. So you, you did it. Now, you have engineering credits as well. So, yeah. So tell me about your engineering side of, of music. I got real lucky, you know, um, coming into it. A lot of people actually um, learn engineering from going to a school, and I'm all behind that. But I got to the point where when, when Wayne got signed and, and then Handsome Devil, when Madonna's putting you in the studio with the top of the line guys, you got all day long to go, what's that button do? <laughs> why, why do you put this over there? And so I actually got a really big understanding of just how I want to put stuff together and how important it is to get things recorded right and, and how to use your compressors so that you're not killing it. And so I, I have a, a 36 channel vintage Trident console, just a huge big analog desk, board. yeah. And then everything's ran through a big Pro Tool, but it's all analog compressors and then the, the big board and then just old, good old mics. And so setting, setting everything up, I really was just able to like use what I learned from Ed Stasium, use what I learned from, from Trombino and from working with Ness. And you know, this is what I want it to sound like and knowing how to record it so that it, at the end it sounds like that. Because recording now, you can, you can plug your guitar on a computer mm -hmm. and it makes it sound like it's supposed to at the end of the record. Yeah. But then you kind of miss the journey and what's important in that isn't there. It's just kind of like, it's here's you your get, polished thing. That's where you get your heart. That's where you get the actual feel of the music. And yeah. it transcends. It really comes through in this album. Oh, American dude, Museum. Y Yusha. Yusha. What? What? Yusha. Yusha. See, this is, this is what happens when I'm just me. Yeah. American well, Yusha. San Diego <laughs> on the bay. Are you kidding? I, yeah. I, you know how many times I've been like, you, 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 you did, I, did, I don't did, know. Did, anyway, it's, <laughs> it's Billy yeah. Stevens here, American Yusha, and you can find it on Amazon.com. I'm Big John here with Backstage 360. Billy, thank you oh, so dude, much again thank for coming you. out. I appreciate and it. With us. Uh, thanks, guys. Backstage thank 360, you. amazing. <laughs>